Uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the UK Anesthesia Network uh, webinar. Uh, it will be a, a very, very nice topic. It, uh, uh, it will be interesting to everyone, I'm sure. It is about the regional anesthesia for hip surgeries. And today we have Dr. Ahmed Rifai. He is a consultant at Oxford University Hospitals. Uh, he is also interested in education, especially, particularly focusing on the regional anesthesia uh, topics. Uh, welcome, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you so much. Welcome, all of you. Shall I start? Yeah, yes, please. Yeah. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Can you please confirm that you can see the presentation now? Yeah, that, that's great. Yeah, okay, I can great. see it. Welcome, everyone. My name is Ahmed. I'm a consultant and at Oxford University Hospital. Uh, I was asked to talk to you today about regional anesthesia for hip surgery slash hip fractures. Uh, this is a long presentation because I'm doing an overview of everything we can do for the hip surgery. Uh, so please bear with me and sorry in advance. So this is Oxford, where I live, and this is John Ratcliffe Hospital, where I work at the moment, which is uh, Oxford University Hospitals. I have no conflicts of interest to declare, and I use the Human Anatomy Atlas app to create the illustrations you'll see. And there are some other pictures I got from different sources, all with references. I'm gonna start the presentation with some admin work, things that you need to know if you work in the UK, especially in England. We have what's called NICE, what we know as NICE is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. And it has recommendations and guidance for management of hip fractures. Every anesthetist in the country should be aware of that. The recommendations have many things, including surgeons, perioperative care, orthogeriatrics, and everything. But what's important to us is the analgesia and anesthesia parts of the, uh, of the guidance. In the analgesia part, it says consider adding nerve blocks if paracetamol and opioids do not provide sufficient analgesia and pain relief uh, or to limit the opioid, opioid usage. Nerve blocks should be administered by trained personnel. And don't use nerve blocks as a substitute for early surgery. So you need to do an early surgery, but always use nerve blocks. And the anesthesia part offer people a choice of spinal or general anesthesia after discussion about pros and cons, risks and benefits and consider interruptive nerve blocks for all people, whether having general anesthetic or spinal anesthetic. So that's this slide. And then, in 2017, in Anathesia Journal, there was a regional nerve blockade for early analgesic management for elderly patients with hip fractures, a review article to review all the evidence that we have and come up with the solutions to what we should do. And the conclusion, it reviewed all the blocks that we do. And it said that all the nerve blocks we do reduce acute pain and the need of opiates and decrease the incidence of delirium, potentially have further consequent benefits for morbidity and mortality and quality of life. That's a lot, a lot of benefit. I personally find it hard to believe when you say that regional anesthesia might reduce mortality, but the uh, the review article found a lot of benefits to nerve blocks in hip fractures. This is another database you need to be aware of uh, if you are doing nerve blocks or doing hip fractures in your hospital. It belongs to the Royal College of Physicians and it's the National Hip Fracture Database. And this is an audit called the National Falls and Fragility Fractures Audit Program, FFFAP. Basically every hospital in the country put the data for hip fractures coming to them into the audit database. And the audit review, everything happens and it measures the compliance with the guidance. So you can look in there. You don't need to look in details, by the way. If you open that website and you go, you can find your hospital by name and you can find your performance and measure it again is the risks or the national performance. And in this diagram, it shows you that we only do regional anesthesia for hip fractures, about 50 to 60% of patients get nerve blocks, not all of them. So there's an area for improvement and we can do much better. And then followed that national audit, there is a guidance on the management of hip fractures that was published in anesthesia in 2020. 
And this is a consensus document between the expert and approved by the AAGBI. And to summarize the changes from everything we knew before, it says that you need to widespread use of peripheral nerve blocks in hip fractures, femoral nerve block and fascia iliac nerve blocks to be used. We don't have enough evidence to support any other blocks. Peripheral nerve blocks should be used routinely to supplement general or spinal anesthesia. And there is little evidence at present for the use of continuous nerve blocks. So you can do one nerve block, but if you want to do a femoral nerve catheter or fascia iliac catheter, there's no evidence to support the benefits of that. And it's time consuming. And if you like regional anesthesia, you must be aware of what PROSPECT is. It's a procedure specific guidance for every surgery. Uh, on pain control and regional anesthesia. And their guidance released in 2021 for hip arthroplasty or hip fractures by their systematic review and published in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine in 2021 summarizes as follows. Use paracetamol and nice steroids for everyone unless contraindicated. Opiates shouldn't be used other than for breakthrough pain only. Femoral nerve block and fascia iliac block are recommended. Depends on local expertise, whether you can do this or that. Epidural analgesia and intrathecal morphine can be used because they reduce pain, but better avoided because they have other side effects. And there is no enough evidence to support other interventions. So all what we have evidence for real evidence is femoral nerve block and fascia iliac compartment block. That was the admin part where we need to know things about guidance and the local policies. But as regional anesthetists, we need to understand anatomy. We need to dive deeply into anatomy to understand what we are blocking and why we are blocking it. So the anatomy of the hip joint is quite complex and the nerve supply is even more complex. You can see here in this picture that we have this lovely nerve that we all know as the femoral nerve. And this one is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. And this one is the obturator nerve which divides to an anterior branch and posterior branch. And those are the most important nerves you need to know. Why? Because the nerve supply of the hip joint comes from many, many nerves. You don't need to read all of that, but you need to know that we have branches coming from the obturator nerve, femoral nerve, sciatic nerve, nerve to quadratus femoris, superior gluteal nerve, and medial articular nerve, uh, anterior division of obturator, posterior division of obturator, accessory obturator nerve. So we have many nerves supplying the hip joint. So if you think that you're going to do a block that blocks the hip joint completely, you're mistaken. This is never going to happen. This is a review study for many anatomical uh, studies before uh, to find out the exact innervation of the hip joint. And it, it concluded that the femoral and obturator nerves and the nerve to quadratus femoris were found to consistently supply the articular branches to both the anterior posterior capsules of the hip joint. The anterior capsule primarily supplied by the femoral nerve, obturator nerve, and the superior labrum appears to be the primary pain generator. So you need to understand that we have a hip joint and the hip joint has a capsule with the anterior capsule and posterior capsule and there's the labrum in the acetabulum and the front part, which is the anterior part, is the main pain generating part. The posterior part is more mechanoreceptors. This is evidenced in this, in another study. But if you have a look here, you can see on the left side is the anterior view of the hip joint. And that's supplied by three nerves, an obturator nerve, femoral nerve, and accessory obturator nerve. On the right side is the posterior view of the hip joint, and that's sciatic nerve, superior gluteal nerve, nerve to quadratus femoris, and inferior gluteal nerve. So laterally, sciatic, inferior gluteal, medially, superior gluteal, nerve to quadratus femoris, and they overlap. But anteriorly, you have the main three nerves, which are femoral, obturator, and accessory obturator nerve. Moving on, this is the acetabulum part, or the labrum. And you have anterior and posterior. The green are the mechanoreceptors and the red are the nociceptors or the pain receptors. You'll find them mainly in the anterior lip and part in the posterior lip. And concluding that into the hip joint, we have the left side is anterior view of the hip joint. The right side is the posterior view of the hip joint. And the anterior view, you can see branches coming from the femoral nerve, 
obturator nerve, an accessory obturator nerve going into the capsule. And this red spot is where most of the pain receptors are. But when you go posteriorly, you can see sciatic, superior gluteal, inferior gluteal, and there is no red spot. So these are mostly mechanoreceptors, all right? And this is the nerve distribution. This part is supplied by the obturator nerve. This part is the femoral nerve and in between is mixed. And if you look posteriorly, you'll find superior gluteal, nerve to quadratus femoris and uh, inferior gluteal, sciatic. And this is a lovely picture from the NYSORA website. It shows you the main nerves and how they go into the hip joint. Starting from the lumbar plexus high up here, you can see that femoral nerve coming on top of the iliacus muscle here, and then crosses underneath the inguinal ligament, and then goes in, gives articular branches to the hip joint. And again, the obturator nerve does the same, coming down here, through the obturator frame in here, goes to the hip joint branches, and then divides into anterior posterior branches. And you have the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve as well, coming down here to supply the skin overlaying the hip joint. This is another anatomic study that studied the innervation of the anterior capsule of the hip, because now we know that it's the main part that carries pain sensation. And it divided it into four quadrants, superior lateral, superior medial, inferior lateral, and inferior medial, but this is not actually important. What's important is that we need to focus on this picture and the next one. From what I said before, I said that we have an anterior capsule, which, is car which carries most of the pain sensation. And the anterior capsule is mainly supplied by femoral, obturator and a accessory obturator nerve. That makes you think that if you go and block the femoral nerve, obturator nerve and accessory obturator nerve, then you will block everything to the anterior capsule and you get rid of the pain. But this is not true because even those nerves, we know that they supply the anterior capsule. Sometimes they give high branches inside the pelvis that separate early and go to the hip joint. So for example, this is from the obturator nerve. As you can see on the right side, this is an illustration that shows you where we are here. And this is a cadaver review. Uh, so this is the hip joint here. And it shows you the obturator nerve, which is here coming out of the obturator frame. And then it divides to the anterior branch and the posterior branch. Before it divides, it gives, and there's the femoral nerve here as well. You can see it. And it gives this branch articular branch from the femoral nerve. And this green labeled nerve is the accessory obturator nerve coming from high up in the pelvis. And those red labeled is the branches coming from the obturator nerve. All right, so this is what we know now. But here, you can see the femoral nerve itself here, where it gives very high branches deep in the pelvis. So this is where the inguinal ligament is. This is the anterior superior iliac spine, and the inguinal ligament is here. All the green marked nerves are nerves that left off the femoral nerve high up in the pelvis and went straight to the hip joint. When you do the femoral nerve block, you do it down here below the inguinal ligament. So when you do that, you will miss all of these nerves going to the hip joint, although they are branches from the femoral nerve, but you have missed them. And this is another cadaver which shows the high branch taken off from the femoral nerve going down to the hip joint. And those are the low branches. So those come straight from the femoral nerve below the inguinal ligament to the hip joint. So you have high femoral nerve branches and low femoral nerve branches. The same thing happened with the obturator nerve here. So this is the obturator nerve coming out of the obturator frame. If you look, you'll have the nerves labeled red are nerves leaving high up in the pelvis and the pink are the low below. So here this is the obturator nerve coming out and these are low branches coming from the obturator nerve. And if you look in this picture, you can see the red nerves coming deep from deep in the pelvis. They leave off the obturator nerve very high to go straight to the hip joint. It's the same here. You have the pink, the labeled pink ones. They leave the obturator nerve low. And there are the red ones that leave the obturator nerve very high. So even if you go and do a femoral nerve block, obturator nerve block, and accessory obturator below the inguinal ligament, there are branches that leave off those three nerves high up to go to the hip joint and you will miss them. So the bottom line from the anatomical studies and what we have see, said so far, that the hip capsule is divided into two parts. You have an anterior and posterior. The nociceptive fibers mostly present in the anterior part, while the posterior part has mechanoreceptors. So you need to block the anterior capsule. But you need to be aware that there are high branches of both the femoral and the obturator nerves. And there's an the accessory obturator nerve as well. 
they provide innervation to the anterior hip capsule. So now, which block and where? Knowing all that anatomy, what shall we do to block the hip joint? I'll repeat what I said before. If you think that you're going to block all the nerves going to the hip joint, you are mistaken. This is not going to happen. If you think that you can do a hip replacement or hemiarthroplasty or a DHS under regional anesthesia other than spinal and epidural, you are mistaken. The goal of nerve blocks and regional anesthesia is to reduce post-optive pain to allow physiotherapy and increase patient satisfaction and reduce the need of opiates. So you need to reduce the pain score from 8, 9 to 2 and 3. And this is achievable using regional anesthesia. Now let's, let's jump into the blocks. So this illustration shows you the hip area or the pelvis area, just born on the left side of the screen and muscles on the right side of the screen. So the main nerves we were talking about is this one, which is the femoral nerve, and this one, the obturator nerve. Sometimes the accessory obturator runs next to it, and the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, which runs here to cover the skin covering the hip joint. Where do they run when you have muscles? Above here, they come from the lumbar plexus up here, and then the lumbar plexus gives you the nerves, which lie on the surface of the iliacus muscle here in the pelvis covered with the fascia iliaca. And then they cross down below the inguinal ligament. You have the lateral femoral cutaneous passing laterally. You have the femoral nerve going down and the obturator nerve goes through the obturator frame and, and then divides into anterior and posterior branch. So you can block them at any of these levels. You can go high up and do a spinal anesthesia or an epidural and that would block everything. Or you can go a bit laterally here, and that's called a lumbar plexus block. Or you can go a little bit down here, block them above the inguinal ligament, and that's called supra-inguinal fascia iliaca block, or fascia, compart fascia iliaca compartment block, or whatever you want to call it. Or you can go down here and block the femoral nerve, or you can call it infra-inguinal fascia iliaca block. Or you can be selective and go and block the nerves, the genicular nerves, the articular nerves that ends just at the capsule. And this is called ping block. Or ping block is what we do as an anesthetist. But if you ask the surgeon to do it intraoperatively, this is called LIA, which is local infiltration analgesia. And always remember, it's very successful as well. You don't need to be the one who's doing the block. The surgeon can do it as well. So we'll talk through those one by one. First one is the lumbar plexus block. I assume that you all know what shamrock approach is, but I'll summarize it quickly. Shamrock is a leaf, it's a green leaf. And it's a stem or a stalk with three leaves around it. And it's called that because someone decided that it looks like it. If we look at that cut section uh, at L4 lumbar vertebra, uh, you have three muscles here around the spine. So we have the source major muscle, or this one, the source major muscle. And then this triangular muscle is the quadratus lumborum. Again, here is the quadratus lumborum. And in the back is the erectrospiny muscle. So if we take half of this and then rotate it around like that, you will see that stem here, which is the transverse process of L4, attached to the tip of it, the quadratus lumborum muscle. In front of it is the source major muscle, and behind it is the erectrospiny muscle. And that's why they call it shamrock, because this is what you see on the ultrasound. How it looks like, this is how it should look like. This is where you put your probe at the level of L4. And then what you see here is the transverse process or the shadow, the acoustic shadow of the transverse process and the body of L4. Attached to it, you'll find the quadratus lumborum muscle. In front of it is the source major muscle and behind it is the erectrospiny muscle. So those are the three muscles. The lumbar plexus in this area runs inside the substance of the source major muscle, and this is the lumbar plexus here. And just bear in mind that this is the abdominal aorta. So remember that there are dangerous structures as well. This is how you put your probe. And that was the lumbar plexus block. Moving to the supra-inguinal fascia iliaca block. To do a supraingual, you need to block those nerves here where they are close to each other. So if you look here, again, you'll find the iliacus muscle. 
and the three nerves close to each other on the surface of the muscle should be covered by the fascia iliaca. So if you're able to put a needle here between that muscle and the fascia covering it, the local anesthetic should spread in this compartment covering those three nerves. Femoral nerve, obturator nerve, and accessory obturator if it's there, and the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. All right. But this view doesn't have any muscles that we can depend on. Let's put some muscles and think, what should we see if we put an ultrasound probe there? So this is the abdominal wall muscles added to the view. And this is the sartorius muscle. And you can see underneath it, this is the iliacus muscle deep down here. And this is the inguinal ligament. Now I'm going to tilt that body a little bit after putting the probe on. This is where you put the probe. If you imagine what you are going to see, at this end of the probe, you are going to see the sartorius muscle. And the other end, you are going to see the abdominal wall muscles. And in between, there is a dip where you can see the iliacus muscle it should be covered by fasci fascia iliaca. Now let's tilt. This is the body tilted. This is the abdominal wall. This is the sartorius and the inguinal ligament. Iliacus muscle is here. So you should see it diving in here. And this one you should see. This is from the Mysura. The sartorius muscle should be in one end of the view. Internal oblique or the abdominal wall muscles on the other end of the view. You can see the pelvic rim or the anterior inferior spine, depending on where you put your probe, down there. And the iliacus muscle diving into the pelvis, covered by fascia iliaca. And this is where your needle should be with local anesthetic separating the muscle from the fascia covering it. This is a very important anatomical landmark, which is the deep circumflex iliac artery because it's on top of the fascia, not underneath it. So if when you inject the local anesthetic, make sure that you see this going up. That means a successful block. Somebody calls this the bow tie block. And this is why, because they think that the muscles look like the bow tie. I don't think so, but yeah. This is how it looked like on ultrasound. So you have a sartorius on one end, internal oblique or abdominal wall on the other end and the iliacus muscle covered with the fascia iliaca, and this is where you need to put your needle. That was the supra-inguinal fascia iliaca block. Moving to the infra-inguinal fascia iliaca, or the femoral nerve block, or individual nerve blocks, because when you go below the inguinal ligament, you can go and block the femoral nerve, and move to block the lateral femoral cutaneous, and then move to block the obturator nerve, which I'm going to show you. So going back to this again, the same anatomy, but this time, we are going to go below the inguinal ligament here. You have a femoral nerve, and laterally you have lateral femoral cutaneous, and medially you should have the obturator nerve. But below here, it will be two obturators, the anterior division and the posterior division. Adding some more structures, and this is what it looks like, and this is where you put your probe for the femoral or the infra-inguinal fascia iliaca block. And this is what you're going to see. The femoral artery, Next to it is the nerve, and this is the iliosolus muscle here, covered by the fascia iliaca. This one, and this is where you should be putting your needle between the muscle and the fascia iliaca, or you can go extend the needle a little bit and inject around the femoral nerve itself. So the idea or the rationale is to separate the muscle from the fascia covering it, and the local anesthetic should spread medially for the femoral nerve and hopefully laterally to get everything else, or codon, uh, uh, kifalet to go above the inguinal ligament to approach all the three nerves, which we used to call before the three in one block. It doesn't happen, believe me. You need a very large volume of local anesthetic and usually it doesn't happen. So if you want to do it, it's much better to do it supra inguinal rather than infra inguinal. And to be honest, this picture is from Mysura, by the way, and it's a too ideal picture. You will never see this picture on a real life patient coming with eight years old with a fractured hip. You'll probably see something like this. And you need to identify the femoral nerve, the muscle, and the artery. So when the texture change, you can see an echo texture here, which looks like a muscle. The elderly patients, they lose the echo texture of the muscle. They look, it looks like this. And the fat will be very bright like that. And it will be quite difficult to identify the demarcating line between the fascia and the muscle. So you need some more experience and practice in that. Moving laterally to look the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, you'll move the probe laterally until it goes here. And at this point, you will see two muscles. This one is the sartorius muscle, and this one is the uh, tensor fasciolata muscle. 
and the lateral femoral cutaneus just lives in between those two. Under ultrasound, this is how it looks like. This is the sartorius muscle, tensor fascia lateral muscle, and this is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve living on top and between them. It's an easy block. I would call this a bow tie, but no one did. Moving medially to the obturator nerve. This is a low obturator block. You might have missed some articular branches already, but if you want to do it, you can do it. And to be honest, no one does this for hip fractures. Uh, you can do it for some urological procedures because the obturator nerve here, you can block it and it would block the motor power of the adductor muscles. So when your surgeon, the urological surgeon is doing a TORBT, for example, and if they are going near the obturator nerve, you will not get the obturator kick in their face. And this is how it looks like under ultrasound. When you move medially, there's a muscle called the pectineus. And next to the pectineus, you'll see three layers of muscle, just like the tap block, which is the adductor longus muscle, adductor brevis muscle, and adductor magnus muscle. And between them, you'll find the two branches or the two divisions of the obturator nerve. This is anterior and this is posterior division. That was the infrainguinal nerves. Then moving to the ping block. Ping block is the pericapsular nerve group block. And the rationale is that we want to leave the main nerves. Don't block the femoral, don't block the obturator, but just find the terminal nerves, left them to supply the joint and block them. Ideally, if you do that, you should block the pain sensation coming from the hip joint. And you should spare the motor power to the quadriceps so the patient can go straight to physiotherapy after the operation because the motor power shouldn't be compromised, theoretically. If you look at here, the idea is to avoid those main nerves and go and block those nerves. Where do we find them and how do we block them? This is the rationale. All those nerves run here between the anterior inferior iliac spine and the iliopubic eminence. Just on top of the bone, underneath the sores tendon. If you can get there, you can easily block them. And this is a study that was studying how much volume should we be using to do that block. And it found that 20 mils gets much better spread. But I got these pictures just to show you the cadaver study of the spread of the dye when you do a proper ping block. This muscle is the iliacus muscle, and that's the psoas tendon. And the nerves run underneath this muscle. And the injection was done underneath that tendon, and it's all painted here. And you need to block those nerves. Those are the articular branches of the femoral, obturator, and accessory obturator nerve going to the anterior capsule of the hip. And this is how it looks like. This is what we need to do. So all the nerves run here. So if you look here, this is the source tendon. All the main nerves run on top of it. But the articular branches need to go underneath this muscle, that tendon, between that tendon and the bone, between the anterior inferior iliac spine and the iliopubic eminence, which is here. So this is the anterior inferior iliac spine. This is the iliopubic eminence. There's a groove in between that takes all the articular branches that comes from all the nerves straight into the hip joint. So if you lay your local anesthetic in this area under the muscle, you should be able to cover all of them. I have tilted the body again, so you can imagine how we are going to see it. This is the anterior inferior iliac spine iliopubic eminence, and there is a depression. There's a groove in between where the tendon runs. Here, this is the tendon running in that groove and the nerves underneath that tendon. And this is where you put your probe. So if the ultrasound probe goes there, you'll see that bony shadow, that bony shadow, that bony shadow, tendon here, and you will not be able to see the nerves. They are very small, but this is where you should be able to lay your local anesthetic. And this is how it looks like on ultrasound. When you put your probe here, you will see an anterior inferior iliac spine, iliopubic eminence, and this groove for the psoas tendon. This is the trajectory of your needle. You need to put it here, touch the bone to put local anesthetic between the tendon and the bone. If you look up here, you will find the femoral artery and the femoral nerve on top of the muscle. You don't need to go there because you don't want to block the femoral nerve. You want to block the articular branches down here. This is another picture. Anterior inferior iliac spine, iliopubic eminence, and the groove where the sores tendon is. You need to come from lateral here, put your needle down here, inject your local anesthetic to spread, to spread here. 
And if you look up, you'll find the femoral artery, femoral vein, and the femoral nerve. Now, the evidence behind all of these. To be honest, they are not enough. I'll show you some studies now. And by the way, they all come from the same group of researchers in South America. So if you look at this one, for example, it's a randomized comparison between pericapsular nerve group block and supraingual fascia iliaca block for total hip arthroplasty. So it's Julian, LST, and Sebastian. And if you look at this one, they are the same group, but they have changed the order of the authors. Uh, it's a randomized clinical trial comparing pericapsular nerve group block and uh, periarticular local anesthetic infiltration of total hip arthroplasty, which is the LEA I told you about. It's the same as PING, but basically you ask the surgeon intraoperative when the hip joint is open to take the local anesthetic and inject around the capsule to block the terminal nerves, and it works. And this is another randomized com study to compare the PING block, uh, and it showed the short-term analgesia is much better, uh, but the long-term outcome is the same. Uh, the same group came up with the pericapsular nerve glue block combined with local infiltration analgesia. So they combined combined LEA with PING and they found very good results without doing any femoral nerve block. Preoperative pericapsular nerve group block for total hip arthroplasty, a randomized placebo controlled trial. And they found that short term analgesia is good, but long term is not that good. And there are some evidence about the LEA, which is interoperative local infiltration by the surgeon, which is quite good as well. Uh, we don't have the same strong evidence to support all of these compared to the femoral nerve and the fascia iliaca block, but they can work. And this is the uh, opinion of the experts in different centers. So to summarize, neck of femur fracture pain is mostly from the anterior capsule. The anterior capsule mainly supplied by the femoral nerve, obturator nerve, and accessory obturator nerve. You need to block the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve for the incision site. Block everyone, whether it's a general anesthetic or a spinal anesthetic. If you are doing a spinal, start with the block to help positioning. Because when you have a patient in pain, positioning for a spinal is quite tricky and the block will help you a lot. Fascia iliaca and femoral are recommended by strong evidence. We don't have enough evidence to support the rest. Ping works but needs something else to do like lateral femoral cutaneous or LEA by the surgeons. And don't forget that LEA works very well as well. Thank you so much. I didn't include any videos in this presentation because that would have made it too long. But if you want to see some videos, I put some on my uh, Twitter account, X account. And this is my handle if you want to see it. Thank you. That's it from me today. And I'll stop sharing the screen. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. That was uh, that was really great. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, uh, it went through all the all the blocks of the of the area, and uh, I guess that the discussion will be um, will be very strong as well. Because uh, in my mind, there is lots of questions about uh, about, uh, for example, what is your preference? You talked about like multiple blocks, and uh, but you didn't say. What, what do you like to do like routinely for all of those patients? So my preference depends on what we are doing. I change things between elective and emergency. So when we start, I'll start with emergency because this is what you all do. Fracture, neck femur, hip fractures coming in trauma lists. Those patients are usually old, frail, multiple comorbidities. Um, if they are not too comorbid, I go for general anesthetic. And when I do a general anesthetic, I do a lumbar plexus block because I don't expect them to mobilize on day zero. So what I do, patient comes in, general anesthetic. I use sucks to intubate them, put them on their side and do a lumbar plexus block. And the question is, why sucks? Because the lumbar plexus block, when you do it in shamrock approach, you don't see the nerves. You just see the shamrock view. And I can see the solus muscle, but I don't know exactly where the nerves are. So I use a nerve stimulator combined with the ultrasound. And once the needle tip approaches the lumbar plexus, I get a quadriceps twitch. And this is where I know I just add the lumbar plexus. And then after doing the block, I paralyze them if needed. 
and that's the general anesthetic. If the patient is in pain or prefers spinal anesthetic, or is there any contraindication for the lumbar plexus block, like dual antiplatelet or anticoagulated patient for AF and stuff like that, because this is a deep block. I go for supra-inguinal fascia iliaca block, and I ask the surgeons to infiltrate around the capsule as uh, Leah as well. And that works very, very well. The advantages is that patient is supine. You don't need to turn them for the supra-inguinal fascia iliaca block. It's easy if you practice it enough, and you'll have a lot of local anesthetic for the surgeons to do. But remember that supra-inguinal fascia block, iliaca block is a fascial plane block, and you need a large volume for that. So I use about 40 mils of 0.125%. I dilute the quarter percent to 0.125% to produce 40 mils of local anesthetic. Put it in supra-inguinal region and ask the surgeon to use like a similar amount or more, uh, same concentration around the capsule. And this works very well. If we are talking about an elective arthroplasty, either hemi or total hip arthroplasty, that's different because you want the patient to mobilize as quickly as possible. So I do avoid lumbar plexus block and I do avoid femoral nerve block and I do avoid obturator nerve block. I go for ping and ask the patient and ask the surgeon for a local infiltration and analgesia layer as well. So either way, I ask the surgeon to do layer and I do one block. It's either high in fracture hips or low, like ping for elective hemiarthroplasty. That's my personal preference. Uh, okay, so that's great. So, uh, uh, so you give like uh, almost the same volume to the uh, surgeon, and you for you and for the surgeon as well. Is that it, right? It depends on how big the, uh, the the patient is, because you need to calculate the. Uh, the maximum local anesthetic volume allowed, and you divide it between yourself and the surgeon, depending on how much you need. So for example, if you're using Vipivacaine, and we are talking about a small uh, old patient, which is 60 to 65 kilos, that means we are allowed about 60 mils of quarter percent, and that means about 100 mils of 0.125. So if I use 40 to 45 mils for supra-inguin and fascia iliaca block, the surgeon can use the same volume. Okay. Yeah. And some centers use rubifacane now. So there's a concentration of rubifacane, which is 2%. And your dose is 3 milligrams per kilo. Uh, so in average patients, you can use 100 mils of rubifacane, 2%. If I take 40 of these, I give the surgeon 60 mils to inject around the hip joint. Okay. So uh, what do you think about like do doing the lower blocks? You are not doing the lower blocks like separate femoral lateral cutaneous and uterior. This is not your... Sometimes, sometimes I do, but as I said, when I do the um, ping block, I do lateral femoral cutaneous nerve block to cover the incision site, mm -hmm. and I ask the surgeon to do the um, uh, a very capsular injection, which is Leah. Okay, thank you. Sometimes uh, so... the surgeons are not comfortable doing Leah, and then I'll go for the femoral nerve and the lateral femoral cutaneous. But to be honest, I haven't done obturator nerve for quite some time. Okay, so you talked about the obturator indication for the urology no. patients here. Yeah. Uh, so one of uh, our colleagues is asking about um, the suggested block for hip arthroscopy and the, which is your block of choice for AMIS. You may know this abbreviation more than me. AMIS. Uh, or if you can, Anisha, if you can uh, just uh, like uh, clarify this uh, abbreviation AMIS. But we, we can talk now about the suggested block for hip arthroscopy, Dr. Ahmed, if you would like. Uh, anterior approach for total hip arthroplasty, it's the same. Yeah, I, I haven't seen uh, hip arthroscopy, so okay. So the hip arthroscopy, uh, it's a painful procedure, uh, but it goes through the hip capsule. So you penetrate the capsule. So basically, it's the same thing. And it's a, an elective procedure, and you want the patient to mobilize as early as possible because usually they are day case surgeries. So I avoid blocking the femoral nerve. For these, I do ping block, just ping block, and local infiltration at the port site by the surgeon. Um, so um, one of our colleagues is asking about the infiltration of local anesthetic by the surgeon. 
do they do this before or after the surgery? Uh, during. So they open the skin, they open, they cut the, uh, the the femoral head. And at the end, after the reduction, after they reduce the the new hip in place, they infiltrate local anesthetic around it before they start closing up. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, about you talked about the giving general anesthetic for some of your patients. Uh, is uh, the eye gel is, uh, is an option for those patients or you usually intubate them? Many, many, many centers, people use eye gels for those. Preferably, I don't. Because, again, we have a fracture hip in a patient who's 90 years old or 85 years old, uh, who's going lateral on their side. I have seen a couple of uh, aspirations on those patients, and that was a game over. So even if it's a 1% or less than 1%, I'm not taking the risk or the responsibility for that. If the patient needs their way to be secured, I can't see any advantage for using an eye gel. Okay. Um, so another question about the pain block. Uh, it is, uh, if there is any concerns from the surgeons about the risk of infection with this type of block? Uh, no, because when we do that, I know that I'm very close to the hip capsule. I do it in full sterilization. So total aseptic technique. Um, that's great. So I'm I'm sorry, Ibrahim, I'm moving from here to there, from no, 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 take your time. one block to the other one. It's just I'm just following the the, answer, the questions of our colleagues. So uh, Dr. Ahmed is asking about the needle direction during supraguinal fascia like a uh, block. The one, sorry, the needle direction. Needle direction, yeah. Uh, so it comes from lateral to medial or inferior lateral to superior medial. You come from the sartorius side. You pass on top of it, and then you go. You, you dive deep down between the fascia iliaca and the iliacus muscle. So you are like uh, uh, putting the probe, like uh, uh, going towards the umbilicus more than uh, caudal cephalic. Is that right? Yes, or... it is oblique. It's not uh, straight up and down. It's a bit oblique. Okay. Um, um, so. Someone, however, has... having mentioned that, there is another technique of doing the supraingual fascia iliaca block. Some people prefer that one, which is going below the inguinal ligament, find the artery, find the nerve, and find the iliacus muscle. And at that point, rotate the probe 90 degrees because you're on top of the iliacus muscle, and then move the probe kephalad until you cross the inguinal ligament and see the uh, circumflex iliac artery. At this point, you can put the needle, and this is when you use the probe kephalad could it. Oh, okay. I think I have seen uh, one uh, one of the doctors was talking about this, about like uh, instead of injecting uh, in the fascia iliaca gland to find the, the nerve, the femoral nerve, and uh, put it like uh, longitudinally, like uh, long axis. And uh, he, he thought that like putting the needle beside the nerve and the going in this direction, like above the inguinal ligament will give a better uh, spread of the anesthetic. Uh, I'm not sure what do you think like with this? that, but you won't be able to track a nerve in longitudinal view. You can track uh, a nerve in cross section, but tracking a nerve in longitudinal view is extremely tricky and difficult because once you go that way, the muscle fibers are longitudinal as well, and the nerve fibers are longitudinal. And in elderly patients, all the soft tissue look alike. But it's a good way trying to track the muscle, but tracking the nerve might be quite tricky. But yes, it's used by a lot of anesthetists by finding the muscle and going on top of it, directing kephalad until you cross the inguinal ligament. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Anisha is uh, asking about uh, uh, repeat the recipe for elective versus emergency hip procedure in a nutshell. I'm sorry, Dr. Ahmed, if you- No, 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 that's like fine. Uh, I'll talk first about elective because elective is easy. The goal, you want the patient to move as early as possible. We are trying to do day case hemiarthroplasties or total hip replacements now. So I do avoid blocking the uh, femoral nerve. I do avoid blocking the obturator nerve. So I do ping block, which is a pericapsular nerve group, shouldn't cause any muscle weakness. And I ask the surgeon to do a local infiltration around the hip capsule as well, which is local infiltration analgesia, also known as LEA. 
And it doesn't really matter whether it's a GA or a spinal anesthetic at that point. You can do either of them. So that's one. I personally prefer general anesthetic because one of the reasons patients stay in the hospital is having a urinary catheter when they have urinary retention after the spinal anesthetic. So I go for a GA, my block, surgeon's block, and it works really well. Uh, for emergency, it really depends on how the patient looks like because the, sometimes they come with terrible comorbidities. Sometimes they're really good. Sometimes they prefer not to go to sleep. Sometimes they refuse the spinal anesthetic. So I don't, again, I don't mind. But if they are going to sleep, I prefer a lumbar plexus block because by doing that, I guarantee a very dense block. And the patients will not complain of pain and recovery. So they are not going to get any opiates. And that's my target. Uh, otherwise, if there's any contraindication for lumbar plexus block, I do a supra inguinal fascia iliaca block because I don't mind now blocking the femoral, lateral femoral tenius and obturator nerve. And I ask the and I ask the surgeon to add a peri uh, capsular block as well. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Hisham is asking about the patient who is or was on a dual antiplatelet or anticoagulant. Uh, do you like uh, do you do you like wait for the uh, half time of these medications, or you will be uh, happy to do the block uh, if those patient has been received recently? Yeah, and so the type of block as well, I think it will make difference. Yeah, so as I mentioned, first of all, we need to clear them for surgery. So if you have a patient with yeah. eating risk, you are doing a bloody surgery, so it can bleed. Yeah, there is guidance in when you can. So if you have an iron, if it's anticoagulated and the INR is beyond 1.5, we reverse it using either potassium or periplex or whatever, if it's an emergency, or wait for a couple of days, which is not favored by the orthogeriatrics because we try to bring them to theater as soon as possible. But if they are fit for surgery from the coagulation point of view, I avoid doing deep blocks. So lumbar plexus is out of the window now. And my preference at this point will be a supra inguinal fascia iliaca block because it's a superficial entry point. And if there's some bleeding, you can just compress on it for five minutes and it's done, whatever the patient is on. Uh, thank you for that, yeah. And of course, so, general anesthetic, no spinal. Yeah, yeah, of course. So uh, there is another question about if you have a cardiac patient, do you, uh, do you think about the general anesthetic first or the regional anesthesia for this patient? Hip, for hip what's, what's the meaning of cardiac patient? Uh, this is uh, there's no such uh, thing. It's, it's Don't big, say uh, cardiac yeah. patient because cardiac patients are a very big variety. We can talk about ischemic heart disease. We can talk about valvular lesions. Yeah. We can grade the valvular lesions from mild, moderate, severe to its pressure gradient. So cardiac exactly. patient needs to be analyzed. You need to understand the yeah. physiology of the patient and build your anesthetic plan based on it. Yeah, exactly. So you have a, if you have a tight aortic stenosis or mitral stenosis, so the regional will not be a good option. But if you have we a patient with heart failure or ischemic heart disease... Yeah, stenotic yeah. lesions generally don't like uh, spinal anesthetic because they are fixed cardiac output. Yeah. Uh, so I prefer going general anesthetic for that, especially if they are dilated and have ejection fraction low as well. Uh, regurgitation lesions, I don't mind. Uh but my preference generally is general anesthetic because this is where I can control everything. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, put me with adrenaline. Do you use adrenaline with the blocks? No, never. Never. <laughs> uh, There's no point, especially when you're using long acting local anesthetic. What's the point? There's no evidence at all that it increases or prolongs the duration of the block or increase the uh, uh, the duration of pain relief or anything. And if there is something, it's just statistical, it will say there's an increase of 15 minutes uh, in the first analgesic requirement or something like that, which is, doesn't mean anything clinically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So Dr. Risham is asking about uh, uh, the role of quadratus lumborum uh, in the hip surgery. No evidence. No evidence. Okay, and um, okay. So, doctor, uh, the and when I say no evidence, it's inconclusive. So you can find a couple of studies and case reports, and they will say this and that. That's why I said there is prospect guidelines, 
And when you go to prospect guidelines, there is a review of all the studies and the case reports and everything. And they concluded that the evidence is not enough to support it. But it is not like one of your uh, armamentarium. It is not one of your tools. No. tools. Yeah. No. Okay. Yeah. So Dr. Frass is asking, uh, uh, this is about the patient with cardiac issue. He's talking about the patient with low ejection fraction, like heart failure patient. Do you think the regional will be a good option for this patient? Uh, again, uh, this is a fixed low cardiac output. It depends on the ejection fraction. Is the patient anticoagulated? Is there a pacemaker? However, regional anesthesia is always good. But whether or not you mean a spinal anesthetic, that's different. The problem with the spinal anesthetic at this point, that when you give it in, you can't take it back. And you can do a sympathectomy quite quickly, which will lead to falling off liquid. You, you, you all know what happens. And sometimes control of blood pressure might be difficult. However, yeah. there are a few case reports in a new trend in that using a continuous spinal anesthesia, using an epidural catheter, using a very small volume. So if you have a very sick patient, but not anticoagulated, so you can put an epidural catheter intrathecal and give like 0.5 to 0.75 mils of local anesthetic plus a microdose of fentanyl. And then you top it up with small volumes until you achieve the surgical anesthesia that you need. And all the case reports came about that seems to be working well. Yeah. I, I think those for us asking about the aortic stenosis, severe aortic stenosis as well. I think I think it is the same idea. It is if you have a very tight a valve like that, you don't need the sudden vasodilation of the spinal anesthetic. Regional is fine, the blocks are fine, but uh, spinal or epidural, you need to be very cautious. And most of us will just uh, go away from a uh, neuroaxial block for a patient with tight aortic stenosis. This is, I think, this is the point. Uh, so, um, uh, so another question about the surgical local anesthetic infiltration. Do they put any uh, like? Uh, Added medications, bicarb, transamic, magnesium sulfate, keto, no. like any of these. No, no. no. Yes, the local anesthetic works nicely. Yeah. Okay, that's that's great. Uh, do block at the end of surgery. Okay, uh, what uh, block you would like to use if uh, to block the site of uh, the incision at the end of the surgery? Not at the end of the surgery. If I want to cover that site of incision, I do lateral femoral cutaneous nerve in the block I do in the beginning. Yeah. yeah. And if the surgeon are infiltrating and have some more local, they can put some in the skin as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, arterial lines used for this in general or no? So do you use plain lubricant for all blocks? And does it begin improve like all the sensory specific group? Okay, so um, uh, one of our colleagues asking about the rule of rupivacan for doing for making the differential block just to help with the physiotherapy after the surgery. Uh, I haven't seen it to be honest. Um, I can't tell that there is a significant differentiation between motor and sensory, they're all the same for me, but. Yeah, the, there is some evidence in the background says that there is a potential role for rupivacaine. Okay, yeah. And um, I think uh, one of our colleagues asking about using arterial line for general anesthetic. I think it, it this is like, uh, as well, it is like the, the cardiac uh, patient uh, question to just... You, you uh, don't decide using arterial line because you're doing a general anesthetic or a spinal. You decide about using the arterial line depending on the Head medical condition of the patient. The patient can be indicated for arterial line, whether you're doing a spinal, local, or general anesthetic. Okay. So, um, uh, uh, thank you for your patience, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, we have lots of questions. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, Dr. Shisham is asking about uh, uh, if you well, if you would like to choose one of two, pink block or sobranguinal uh, fascia iliaca block. What do you what do you will choose first? They are not the same. They are two different things. And they have indications. Uh, if you want a dense block, you go supraingual. If you want a good block supported by local infiltration, but you want early mobilization, that's ping. Okay. Yeah. And as I said, my personal preference in fractures is supraingual fascia iliaca block because it helps me positioning the patients as well. 
Okay, I think you have covered the Dr. Walid's question as well. So um, I'm not sure, I'm gonna wait. So uh, I have no more questions in the chat at the moment. So if anyone wants to add anything, that would be great. And Can I ask a question, please? Uh, yeah, you, you are, uh, is that Dr. Zawalid? You are welcome. Uh, thank you very much. I, I'm sorry for not writing my question in the chat box because I'm driving. That's fine, but just be careful. <laughs> not sure that's legal, but go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, for this comprehensive uh, uh, coverage for this topic. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my questions would be, uh, what are the adjuvants of choice uh, uh, of your preference? To uh, be added to LA? None. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, another question, please, uh, about catheters. Uh, if I'm going to use catheter, what what's my preferred catheter in such a lumbar plexus or fascia like a block? Uh, you yeah. prefer any type of catheters? This is, I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, that there is no evidence to support that there is any extra benefit of putting catheters in any blocks for hip surgery. Okay. okay. So uh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Th thank you, Tram. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, any one of our colleagues asking about if you are doing, uh, I believe you are doing lots of hip surgeries in your hospital. So uh, any pre-op, uh, prehabilitation for elective hip surgery patients that you are aware of to optimize it's the... The same program for prehabilitation for everyone. Uh, so those patients, the elective ones are on the list for years because we have a very long waiting list, as you all know. They are giving the instructions uh, about eating and exercising and walking and everything, but most of them reach a point. When they come to theatre, they reach a point where they're actually um, handicapped because of the hip pain. So it's difficult. Uh, it's just about lifestyle change and about the nutrition, and that's it. We haven't reached the day case hip surgeries yet. Uh, I don't think very few centres try them. Uh, but I don't believe it's happening in the UK yet, just under trial in some places. We haven't reached it in our hospital, but we are trying. Uh, but yeah, this is what we where we are at the moment. Um, yeah, uh, thank you. That's great. So um, I I think now I don't have any more questions. Do you, do you want to add anything from your side, Dr. Ahmed? Uh, no, thank you so much for having me today. I hope that was... Um, enough to satisfy the needs of everyone and i'm happy to take any questions anytime it, it is just my question i was just uh, uh i have done the lumbar blex block few times this was long time ago and i stopped that because of the like incidents of complications and things N nothing happened with me but it's just it is like it is a deep block as you said the uh and also um uh, uh, the point that you highlighted about the use of nerve stimulator because you can't see the nerves actually you can you can just see the the tissue the sores muscle so um, do do you think it's a good block to uh, to work on for those hip surgery patients? So I personally like it, and um, because I use both ultrasound and nerve stimulator, it's quite safe in my hands. It might not be safe in other people's hands. Uh, it's not really indicated now for many things because since the supraingual fascia iliaca block came in action, you actually can block the same nerves with the correct volume. Uh, it's just the lumbar plexus block allows the use of smaller volume of local anesthetic, but in many, many patients, it might be contraindicated. Okay, yeah. Um, so about the, I have seen the block that you were doing on LinkedIn. It is very, very nice video of uh, an example of a geriatric patient with like bad tissue uh, characters and the, the, the echogenicity was not, was not great. And uh, my question is, when you put the needle and you reach the space and you start to inject the local anesthetic, do you do any movement with the needle? You just go uh, into uh, the spot and inject all the volume, or do you want? To, do you tend to to go like uh, lateral, medial, cephalic, caudal, anything else? When you once you open space? the correct space, you just unzip the fascia from the muscle. When you are in this plane, the local anesthetic will spread. It doesn't need you to do anything. That's great. So uh, I, I can't thank you uh, enough, Dr. Ahmed, for this nice, nice lecture. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it myself.
uh, there was like lots of discussions, lots of questions. The attendance was great. So I, I, I'm really happy that I I have you uh, today, Dr. Ahmed. And thanks thank you so much for the invitation and for having me today. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much. Right. And uh, yeah, do you want to add something? No, 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 I'm just thanking you. Yeah, well, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. And uh, and that's it. And uh, uh, for for all that, and uh, if you uh, are not on the you can group, uh, you will be welcome. And uh, if anyone uh, like find himself is ready to do presentations or help us with his knowledge, if someone is like uh, uh, focused on certain part of the uh, of our anesthetic or intensive care or pain practice, and he wants to benefit the other people, he is welcome. You can just contact me directly on the LinkedIn group or the Facebook group, and uh, you are welcome all. Uh, I'm very, very happy to see you all uh, on this webinar. Thank you. Have a nice day, everyone.